My name is Carolyn Worth. I'm the manager of the Southeastern Centre Against Sexual Assault, CCASA. CCASA is one of the 15 CASAs in Victoria. There are 14 direct service centres against sexual assault. Six of them are in the metropolitan area, which includes the Royal Children's Hospital Gatehouse Centre, who only see adolescents and children, and there's another nine in regional Victoria. The CASA see female and male victim survivors of sexual assault and family violence. We see clients of any age. Now I would like to introduce to you Sharon Zacks. Dr. Sharon Zacks has worked in private general practice in Melbourne and regional Victoria for 20 years. She's currently practicing in East St Kilda and Creswick. For her whole practicing life, Sharon has had a very strong interest in treating people who are anxious or phobic. This group still makes up a large proportion of her patients. Sharon finds working with this group extremely rewarding. Trauma is in Sharon's background. Her father and uncle are both dentists and all of her grandparents survived the Holocaust. As a young child, Sharon had her own trauma in a medical setting and vowed to change things from the inside one day when she was old enough. This project has been completed on a voluntary basis. Sharon has collaborated with several people from the Centres Against Sexual Assault and we are all extremely proud to be involved with this project. I would now like to introduce you to Dr. Sharon Zacks. Thank you very much, Carolyn. It's wonderful to be here. It was a cold June night and I was rugged up in my room, tired after a long day. As usual, I was calling patients back to see how they were recovering after procedures. And I came to one of my favourite patients, Anna. Anna has a history of severe childhood trauma and she said something that immediately energised me. Don't underestimate the impact you can have, Sharon Zacks. It was a turning point coming to you. Before I met you, I was struggling with self-care. You took my treatment seriously. The quality of your care and compassion made me realise that I was actually someone worth taking care of. Shortly after we started her dental treatment, Anna got together with her first partner in many years, which was a big deal. I didn't know any of this until Anna told me. I'm sharing this true story with you because it encapsulates several of the key messages of this lecture. It's not just aesthetic rehabilitation or pain relief that can be fulfilling for us. The relationships we have with our patients can result in profound improvements to the quality of their lives. In summary, we never know the impact we can have. This lecture is in three parts. To get the most out of this training, I highly recommend that you watch the videos in order. In part one, I will discuss the scope of the issue and why survivors avoid dentists. I will define trauma and how it changes the brain and look at ways survivors present to us. In part two, I will discuss the trauma-informed skill set, how this relates to our current anxiety management techniques and how to best respond to a disclosure of a history of sexual assault. Part three explores practical strategies for managing trauma patients before, during and after appointments and for looking after ourselves in the process. My vision for the future will lead into the conclusion. Before I start, I want to say that I know this is a confronting topic and that it may bring up difficult emotions. Some of you may yourselves be survivors. As you watch these videos, Please remember to take breaks as you need and be gentle with yourselves. If you feel triggered by any of the content, please speak to someone. Phone numbers for further support are listed at the end. Also listed at the end are all the references and links to resources that I discuss throughout these videos. In this first part, I'm going to take you through some really challenging material. But hang in there because there's so much we can do about it which I'll cover in parts two and three. 
In this video, I will start by looking at the scope of the issue of sexual assault. After this, I'll explore why survivors avoid the dentist. Next, I'll define trauma and how it changes the brain. The ways patients with a trauma or sexual assault history can present to us will complete this video. Now, let's begin. All statistics are known to be underestimations due to underreporting. The World Health Organization estimates that 35%, that's more than one in three women worldwide, have experienced sexual violence. This is nearly one billion women. Here in Australia, one in three women and one in six men have been sexually assaulted by the age of 18. Therefore, it's logical that we are seeing these survivors as our regular patients without any awareness of their history. This includes children and teenagers who are currently experiencing sexual abuse, as well as adult survivors of childhood sexual assault. 97% of the offenders are men. Almost all the victims know the offender. Over half of girls and women who are raped are assaulted in their own home or the home of the offender. Sexual violence affects people from all communities across all socioeconomic, religious and ethnic cultural groups. Certain groups, however, are more vulnerable, really anyone different. For example, people who are LGBTIQ have higher rates of assaults and abuse, both in the family and community. Evidence shows that once you've had one experience, especially in childhood, you are more vulnerable to further sexual assault and violence in adulthood. This is the case with nearly three quarters of women so be aware of the increased risk in these patients. What is sexual assault? In its simplest form, a sexual act without consent. The CASA definition is any unwanted sexual act or behaviour which is threatening, violent, forced or coercive, traumatic and sometimes life-threatening. Consent means both parties agree freely to proceed. A child or anyone with cognitive impairment, for example, if they are drug or alcohol affected, is incapable of giving consent. Sexual assault involves a wide range of activities, including unwanted touching and penetration by a penis, object or other body part into any orifice. The mouth is very commonly involved, such as kissing or being made to perform oral sex. Verbal threats and physical force are commonly used to coerce the victim into sexual acts. Sexual assault is a legal term to describe this crime and is an act of violence with a sexual overlay. Sexual assault is about power more than sex. One of the most common examples of sexual assault is childhood sexual abuse. This occurs when a person uses their power or authority over a child to involve them in sexual activity. Offenders have a vested interest in denial of the abuse. They work to discredit and silence their victims. Unlike the sexual assault of adults, a much more gentle process called grooming is often used with children. This involves using a combination of fear, shaming and conditioning to coerce the child. Victims become convinced that they are to blame for the abuse. For example, an offender saying something like, if you weren't so beautiful, I wouldn't have to do this. Common emotions the victim may feel are like they are damaged goods, that they are dirty and should be ashamed. The offender convinces the victim that they are responsible for everything, including the emotional well-being of the offender. For example, they may say, I love you so much. If you stop, I will kill myself. These feelings become deeply ingrained in the victim's psyche. Fast forward to dental appointments as an adult and it makes sense that victims feel responsible for all the emotions going on in the surgery. It's common for victims to be hyper aware of everything going on around them, including any upset, disgust, anger, stress, or anything else that actually belongs to the dentist or staff. This is especially relevant, for example, if treatment doesn't go as planned or has to stop and the dentist gets upset about this and blames the patient, or the patient perceives that they are being blamed. 
Victims may feel ashamed and awful about themselves for making things difficult for us as authority figures. We must be very aware of our own emotions and reactions to avoid this. I'll discuss this more in the second video in the section about trust and safety, but keep it in mind. Treating children is a very different lecture. I'll focus on adults here. Now, from sexual assault in general to some dental statistics. I was involved in a CASA study of the dental experiences of Victorian adult female and male survivors of sexual assault. They were surveyed from 2015 to 2016 using anonymous online and paper surveys. I'll share just a few of the eye-opening results with you now. The rest are included in the references. 63%, that's almost two thirds of respondents, had put off urgent dental treatment due to issues such as paralyzing fear, anxiety, and shame. I'll go into much more detail about this later. People had put off the dentist from a few weeks to when the pain became too bad to 19 years. Three quarters of the women wanted to see a female dentist. A constant theme in the responses was difficulty gaining access to a dentist who was understanding. Survivors indicated that they want a dentist who is not judgmental of their reactions to procedures and to the bad state of their teeth. The quotes written by survivors were all very moving. Here is a small selection. I know my teeth are bad and I don't want a lecture that makes me cry. I have not been since I was 12. I am now 31. I have huge fear because of my abuse. In answer to the question, what do you have difficulty with and why? One survivor wrote, flossing because blood in my mouth is one of my worst triggers. And if it accidentally happens when I'm flossing, my whole day is ruined as I'm thrown into full on PTSD mode. In answer to the question, why do you put off urgent dental treatment? A person wrote, too afraid and embarrassed, embarrassed for being afraid and that the dentist would think I was an idiot for being scared. Another survivor had put off urgent dental treatment because of how invasive it feels having the dentist so close to my body. A large Canadian study of the dental experiences of survivors found that only one third of women with a history of childhood sexual assault believed that disclosing information to the dentist would be potentially useful. Participants said when they did disclose their history of childhood sexual assault, this was not taken into account by their dentist in a serious way. So we have a disconnect on both sides here with survivors suffering in silence or avoiding coming to us altogether and dentists feeling ill-equipped to cope or unaware of the situation. I want to put this all in context with a few things to bear in mind about survivors. Firstly, not all survivors have these issues coming to dentists, although there is a very widespread problem here. Secondly, there is a very large proportion of survivors who don't get any counselling or official help. They just adapt, move on and live their lives. There are many entrenched cultural and societal barriers to coming forward and counselling is not for everyone. People have other resources and ways to support themselves. This doesn't necessarily mean that issues have been resolved or that their coping strategies are all healthy but at the same time, there is a huge range of responses to and outcomes of sexual assault. Before I complete this section, it's worth clarifying why survivors are more vulnerable to re-victimisation. This is complex and involves many factors, but in a nutshell, it's because survivors have usually been taught from an early age to override the butterflies in the stomach that tell them to take themselves out of situations. As a result of this, they are generally not good at reading what's really going on. In summary, sexual assault is any unwanted sexual behaviour which may or may not be violent. Millions of people are affected. The offenders are mainly men who are known to the victim. A person is more likely to be assaulted as a child than as an adult. Child sexual abuse involves a person using their power over a child to coerce them into sexual behaviour. Victims are usually abused by someone they thought they could trust and then shamed and silenced. Abuse as a child makes victims more vulnerable to further abuse later in life. 
The effects of childhood sexual abuse are carried on into adulthood and can affect all aspects of life, including dental appointments. The mouth is very commonly involved and there is a big issue with widespread dental avoidance by survivors. As dentists, I believe we have an ethical obligation to address this, which leads me to my next question. Dental appointments can parallel the sexual assault scenario. Thus, they are a trigger for memories to return, leading to anxiety and panic. The fight-flight-freeze response is activated by the brain as a survival mechanism in situations that are similar to the original trauma. So, let's look at the commonalities between dental appointments and sexual assault. Offenders reassure victims that their sexual activities are coming from a positive place, often suggesting out of love or teaching them something. They groom vulnerable people over time, starting with things that seem safe. We are asking patients to trust us, and even if there are unpleasant sensations or pain, we reassure patients the treatment is in their best interests. Understandably, survivors might be scared of being betrayed again. Next, being lowered into the horizontal position. This may trigger memories of being in someone's lap or lying prone while the trusted adult is upright, making them feel physically vulnerable. Working above patients and accidental touching due to the very close proximity of bodies is another big trigger. Studies looking into avoidance behaviour found that invasion of personal space through uninvited touch is a major factor. Most survivors like to control who touches them and how they are touched. Closely related to this, putting hands on the patient's nose, mouth or face is another very common trigger for memories to return. Patients having to remain very still brings back memories of being pinned down or trapped. Having the mouth filled up triggers memories of being suffocated, choking, or having foreign objects placed into their mouths. Having to open the mouth for prolonged periods of time is common to both scenarios. Latex gloves trigger memories of the smell of condoms. The gender of the dentist can remind a patient of the offender, particularly if they're wearing fragrances like aftershave, deodorant or perfume. Survivors may be triggered by unpredictability regarding what's going to happen next and what to expect, as they often didn't understand what was happening to them and had no control over it. The feeling of not being able to speak up about problems or refuse treatment. This is due to a history of complaints being silenced or feelings being discounted by those in authority. The assault stays as a body memory, which is why the physical similarities are so critical. In summary, there are many commonalities physically, psychologically and emotionally that we must be sensitive to as dentists. Particularly, we must be mindful of the power imbalance dental treatment creates, both physically and psychologically, especially for those with a history of power being abused. Trauma stems from a normal response to overwhelming stress. A trauma response is most likely when you can't alter a situation, when you have no agency, when you've lost control. When trauma occurs, the stress hormones don't go to the muscles as usual for fight or flight. They go straight to the emotional centre of the brain, causing feelings of panic and helplessness. This then becomes a central reality around which profound neurobiological adaptations occur. Trauma is biochemically encoded in the brain. There are lots of traumatic experiences in life, like accidents, the death of a loved one or pet, and injuries. Although they are often very painful and upsetting, they have a context, allowing them to be understood, dealt with and accepted, and given a location in our memories. This is what allows us to move on with our lives. An experience only becomes defined as trauma if it stays unresolved after the events have passed. Unresolved means that a person doesn't have the support or resources that they need at the time of the trauma to adequately understand and process the situation 
file it away and move on. A common example is a child who can't talk to anyone about sexual assault by a family member, so they stay isolated with no way to make sense of what has happened and integrate the experience. Trauma is a failure of the central nervous system to move the sensations related to the trauma memory into an integrated memory. The events that become traumatic differ from person to person and many variables are involved. There is a continuum of trauma from mild to severe. The more severe it is, the more repressed the memory. This repression is a protective survival mechanism. The outcome of trauma is influenced by many factors. These include whether early development was disrupted or not, whether it was a single incident or multiple events, and whether the trauma was personal like sexual assault or impersonal like a bushfire. There are three main changes that occur in the brains of traumatised people. All of this is relatively new evidence. Firstly, the brain becomes stuck in survival mode. This is due to feeling unsafe and pervasive fear. The world becomes chaotic and dangerous. The brain relies on fight, flight and freeze so much that they become automatic. A person feels unsafe in their body, with their feelings and even with their own thoughts. There is a huge release of cortisol and adrenaline which affect the brain, especially in childhood. The brain becomes fixated on escape from threats and subconsciously scans everything for them. As a child, the developing emotional brain becomes a survival brain, which is suboptimal compared to the learning brain that develops when the environment is safe and supportive. While in survival mode, the brain is not open to new experiences or new learning. Trauma massively impedes the developmental task of self-awareness. The thinking brain gets hijacked by fear, so a person can't access it. Therefore, all decisions are impaired. As an adult, midline brain structures devoted to your own experience of yourself and self-sensing get blunted. This is because the terror felt in the body is so unbearable. As a defence, a person learns to dampen the response to the self. Unfortunately, this also affects responses to everything else, like pleasure, sensuality, connection and excitement. An example of this for us is a survivor viewing the dental surgery room and everything in it, including all the adults, as a possible threat. The second big brain change is that the alarm system becomes very distorted. Danger is perceived in all situations, even positive ones. There is a big interference to being present. The blood flow and thus function of the frontal lobe, which deals with learning and problem solving, is decreased and the sensitivity of the impulsive, primitive limbic system, the amygdala, is increased. So, it's much harder and takes longer to get calm. The brain is just driven by fear. This all results in a person becoming unable to make use of resources and relationships. A clinical example of this for us is that a survivor may remain rigid in the chair and be unable to relax or keep their mouth open wide even when asked to repeatedly. The ability to appraise the present and learn from experience is the third major way trauma changes the brain. The filtering system higher up in the brain can't distinguish between what is relevant right now and what can be dismissed. Therefore, a person can't focus on the present or fully engage with ordinary situations. Bad experiences stick way more than good ones and can't compete with the weight of the bad. This is actually how our species has survived. Applying this to sexual abuse, consider that it most commonly occurs around the age of key developmental stages, mostly before 11 years of age. The experience will remap the whole autonomic nervous system, which is then very hard to unmap. It gets written into the whole way that person is socialised and their lived experience in their bodies. They don't realise their bodies shouldn't be doing certain things because it's the only reality they've ever known. Up until very recently, it has been thought that survivors are not amenable to healing. They have been stigmatised as having a personal weakness and being stuck and unable to move on from a negative story and mindset.
A dental example of this stigma is the receptionist coming in after meeting a new patient with dismissive comments like, look out, they're crazy, only do the minimal amount for that patient, and other comments to survivors like, pull yourself together, woman. The sequence up until very recently has been that people can't talk about it, which creates increased difficulty. This leads to becoming full of shame, locked up and isolated. Their identity becomes a sufferer. Due to misconceptions about trauma, sufferers have been condemned for being imprisoned in a story of the past and not moving on. The great news from recent research and this new physical evidence and understanding of trauma is that people are finally able to share the truth of what happened and feel heard and understood. This is what leads to healing. The stigmatising and blaming of victims is changing. In addition to the traditional cognitive techniques, there are now several touch and body centred modalities specifically developed for trauma. These calm the central nervous system and allow integration and healing. To sum up, an experience only becomes defined as trauma if it stays unresolved after the events have passed. Survivors are therefore more likely to perceive a situation as threatening and to be unable to interact with their current surroundings. Trauma changes the brain so it becomes stuck in survival mode with a distorted alarm system, resulting in great difficulties being present and with self-calming. Speaking of self-calming and being present, here is a quick break. Most of the time, we won't know or be told that a patient has a history of sexual assault. The patient themselves may not know if they've blocked it out or if it occurred at a very young age. They may not want to tell us and we can't ask them. Therefore, it's critical that we have enough knowledge of how it may present to us to be able to put a picture together. There is a great diversity of coping strategies among survivors and how people tackle situations and experiences. It's complex, so we can't assume anything. I will go through some of the most common presentations of trauma. None of these are surprising given the brain changes I just described. They are all a result of the autonomic nervous system getting stuck in high alert crisis mode over a long period. As you know, the autonomic nervous system controls every body system from digestion to immunity. So it's not surprising that they all break down in the long term. Here are the reactions, behaviours and fears to look out for. Firstly, emotional reactions include guilt, shame, anger, rage, sadness, grief, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, specific fears, or the absence of emotional reactions. Cognitive responses include flashbacks, which are highly persistent memories of traumatic experiences. They are activated automatically by the current environment and are lived again as vividly as the initial events. Survivors are more likely to develop an external locus of control, meaning they generally believe their successes or failures in life result from external factors beyond their control, like fate, luck or injustice. This is associated with psychological disorders. Other cognitive reactions to trauma include intrusive and or suicidal thoughts, confusion, low self-esteem, loss of faith, nightmares, perceptual disturbances, and something I'll elaborate on shortly, dissociation. These all commonly lead to underachievement in education and employment. Now, behavioral responses. There's great difficulty modulating and calming the self leading to substance use like smoking, alcohol or other drugs, eating disorders, self-harm and addictions. Consider the obvious flow-on effects of these to oral health. Also, obsessive and compulsive behaviour, aggressive behaviour, isolation and alienation. There are sleeping problems and losing touch with normal daily routines like brushing and flossing. Reminders of the traumatic events are avoided, like us, 
This often translates into being unreliable with keeping appointments. Survivors commonly learn not to care about themselves and ignore or disregard signals by their bodies, such as pain. Consider the effect of this on oral health, for example, with how long a survivor will put up with a toothache. In relationships, there is a basic perception that people will hurt you, which leads to a protective approach. This can look like aggression, being arrogant, distant, or a compliant people pleaser. Consider this when you meet new patients. An example from real life is a patient who is very easily offended or who needs you to call and demands a lot of your time on the phone. A massive outcome of trauma is mental illness. And I quote, the single most significant predictor that an individual will end up in the mental health system is a history of childhood trauma. And the more severe and prolonged the trauma, the more severe are the psychological and physical health consequences. This is from the well-known psychiatrist, Professor Warwick Middleton. Overall, trauma has harmful effects on mental and physical health, economic participation and social connectedness. Therefore, survivors are much more likely to enter the criminal justice and welfare systems. In summary, trauma results in emotional reactions like guilt, shame and panic attacks. It leads to cognitive responses like intrusive thoughts and memories. Maladaptive coping behaviours include addictions and defensive approaches to relationships. Mental illness and social isolation are very common. What does a patient with a trauma background look like in the waiting room or dental chair? Unsurprisingly, the fight, flight, freeze and dissociation responses are activated. Indicators of the fight or flight response include hypervigilance, intense distress, increased sensitivity to pain, panic attacks, a pronounced startle response, and difficulty with self-regulation. For example, signs of stress, which are not just sweating and rapid breathing, but also include irritability, agitation, a heightened gag reflex or choking, reduced concentration and memory, confusion and disorientation. In contrast to this, the dissociation and freeze responses are harder than fight and flight to recognise. They are often missed as it can look like a patient is coping well because they are quiet. Dissociation is a dampening of perception. The patient is not present. In the freeze response, mobility is paralysed, deer in headlight style, but the patient is still present and will hear you. It's very hard to tell them apart. Both are shut down and withdrawn responses. An example from real life is when a patient becomes quiet and vague, stares into space and can't remember things like what day it is. They don't answer when you talk to them and are spaced out, away with the fairies and not with you. Other signs of dissociation include changes in voice tone and pitch, loss of coherency or can't remember much when discussing their childhood years, abruptly switching from a calm discussion to a hostile, terrified or shut down state, inappropriate affect when discussing distressing events, and finally, speaking in the third person about the self. Dissociation is a common coping strategy that is not necessarily good or bad. We all use it as a way to escape mentally when we can't physically. The difference is that it can be distressing to survivors who may either be unable to control whether they dissociate or unaware they are doing it. I'll discuss this further in the third video. The following reactions are more specific to those who have suffered trauma from sexual abuse. Resistance to opening the mouth, a heightened gag reflex, which studies show is a very common impact of forced oral sex, a suspicion of drugs, as a survivor may have been drugged prior to the assault, turning the head away in the opposite direction, stopping the dentist by holding their arm, uncontrollable crying, inability to keep their feet or body still, requests for pain relief for minor procedures, only attending for emergencies, being unreliable with keeping appointments, bruxing, and finally, difficulties with oral home care. There is a unique combination of dental fears that survivors commonly carry, which can also give us clues.
the number one cause of dental fear in all studies of survivors of sexual assault is the lack of control. One study found that a perception of uncontrollability was so great that it was a better predictor of dental fear compared with real negative dental experiences. Survivors have learnt that their wills and desires don't count. It's very disempowering. Another fear related to loss of control is having to lie back. The horizontal position is a major trigger and survivors often feel naked in the dental chair. Next, fear of not being able to breathe, swallow, gagging or vomiting during treatment. This leads to more difficulty than usual coping with instruments in the mouth, especially things like bite blocks and rubber dam. Procedures that fill the mouth like impressions are also often a struggle. Fear of the dentist becoming angry or impatient. Fear of being perceived as crazy or alarming. Fear of an uncontrollable panic attack leading to extreme embarrassment and irrational behaviour. And finally, fear of being alone in a room with a more powerful or educated authority figure while being prone and helpless in the chair. Remember, this is what happened to them as children or in the past. What often happens with survivors is the vicious cycle of dental anxiety that I'm sure you've seen, with fear and anxiety leading to avoidance of dental care, then deterioration of the dentition, and further embarrassment, guilt, shame, and inferiority. It's no surprise based on all of this that survivors have extremely poor oral health and attendance with more chronic pain, unusual presentations of pain, bruxism and TMD, a higher risk of dry mouth and erosion, a poor, highly cariogenic diet, oral impacts of various addictive behaviours like comfort eating, smoking and alcoholism, more periodontal issues because of difficulties with home care, and for periodontitis, smoking and stress. For example, as a result of their trauma history, I have seen patients who just can't bear to put a toothbrush in their mouths, let alone floss. This is sadly very common. In summary, survivors most commonly present to us in fight, flight, freeze and dissociation modes, with a unique combination of fears and behaviours, including being unreliable with appointments, a heightened gag reflex, fear of anger of the dentist, difficulty with home care, more pain and unusual presentations of pain. Their mouths are commonly very neglected due to a combination of everything I've just discussed plus poor attendance. Keep in mind these are all generalisations and many survivors won't give us the slightest hint of a clue of their history. One major message and theme to drive home from all of the information in this first video is that survivors of sexual abuse are often profoundly isolated and feel they don't belong. Firstly, from within their own families. Here, they have a dual reality because they can't talk about their abuse openly. This contradicts their lived experience. They know they don't belong in an environment where something like this can be allowed to happen. Later on, they are isolated in communities because they can't talk for fear of being rejected from school to friendships to work. Most devastatingly, they have been cast out of themselves, their bodies, thoughts and emotions, which are all deemed unbearable. I realise this has been a lot of bad news and it's understandable if you're feeling overwhelmed at the moment. The very good news is that as dentists, we can make a profound impact by connecting with our patients and bringing them back into a sense of belonging a feeling that their needs are just as important as anybody else in the room. How do we achieve this? And what can we do about this widespread and heartbreaking problem? Stay tuned for part two, where I'll discuss the current evidence-based best practice approach from the trauma field, which I have adapted to dentistry. Then I'll marry up our current anxiety management techniques with this new paradigm. Finally, I'll address how to sensitively respond if a patient discloses a history of sexual assault to you. Thank you for watching and see you in part two.